Well, welcome back to the Change Position Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Melissa Cady, with my co-host, Dr. Kevin Kakaro. And believe it or not, we got Dr. Michael Greger here with us today. We are so excited. We have author, physician, professional speaker, the founder of nutritionfacts.org to give us a little insight on his story of evolution as a physician. So thank you, Dr. Greger, for joining us today. So happy to be here, excited about what you're doing. Awesome. And you're on a treadmill. You make me so proud. <laughs> <laughs> it's you go to your local thrift store, get a cheap treadmill, throw it under a table with some cheap plastic shelving and duct tape, and you are good to go. I love it. So practical. Well, tell us just from the top, why did you even consider it? a lot of people who know you know your story, but for those that don't, why did you even think about going into medicine? Yeah, you know, for me, it really uh, started uh, because of my grandmother. I was just a kid when my grandmother was uh, sent home in a wheelchair to die, essentially. She had end-stage heart disease, so many bypass operations. She just kind of got all uh, scarred up inside. Um, uh, confined in a wheelchair, crushing chest pain. Her life was over at age 65. Uh, but then she heard about this guy, Nathan Pritikin, one of our early lifestyle medicine pioneers. And what happened next is actually detailed in Pritikin's biography. Uh, it talks about Frances Greger, my grandmother. And they wheeled her in and uh, she walked out. Uh, though she was given a medical death sentence at age 65, thanks to a healthy diet, she's able to enjoy another 31 years on this planet until age 96 to continue to enjoy her six grandkids, including me. That's why I went into medicine. That's why I started practicing lifestyle medicine, uh, why I started nutritionfacts.org, why I wrote the book, How Not to Die, why all the proceeds from all my books are all donated directly to charity. I just want to do for everyone's family what Pritikin did for my family. Awesome. And I know that she was able to see you graduate medical school from what I read, correct? Yeah. Oh, wonderful. And so you knew that you tried, you went to Tufts University, you knew they had a little bit of nutrition, um, but going through all your training, did you kind of have a little bit of an awakening that this was way more of a problem than maybe what you thought going in? Oh, well, they didn't just have a little nutrition. They had the most nutrition training of any medical school in the country. That's why I chose them. Mm -hmm. But what most was was 21 hours out of thousands of hours of preclinical instruction. So basically nothing. Yeah. Um, but that was the best they have an associated nutrition school um, right there on the medical campus. But still, uh, it's pretty, pretty shameful. Less than a quarter of medical schools have a single dedicated course on nutrition, even though, according to the Global Burden of Disease Study, the largest study of disease risk factors in history, funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the number one cause of death in these United States is our diet. Um, cigarettes only kill about a half million people every year, whereas our diet kills many more. So it's the single most important decision um, we make in terms of our health and longevity. And so you'd think it'd be the number one thing taught in medical school. It's the number one cause of death, leading cause of disability. But alas, it's not. That's why I do what I do. Yeah. Kevin, I don't want to interrupt you. Were you going after a question there? Well, I, I was just kind of interested and in you touched on it because with your experiences with your grandmother, it sounds like you had this interest in plant-based nutrition before medical school. And so now, you know, you went in and you chose Tufts because they had the most, most nutrition in their curriculum, which was still lacking. But I'm really kind of curious is when you were in then your rotations, is what did you encounter then on the floors when you were actually rotating, rotating with, with your attendings and you're having discussions and you're seeing these lifestyle diseases? What did you feel at that point in time? You just got to keep your head down and get <laughs> through it. Now, I started out a little more uppity, um, but uh, it's just that's just not the way. You know, medicine is a real kind of rigid hierarchy kind of almost kind of military like for those of us who've been through medical training such that there's just there's no questioning from below it doesn't matter if you're right you know you just don't make your attendings look bad you don't you know kind of one up and so really it's about look i know the science um and i just gotta 
you know, get through this so that I can practice medicine the way I know best. And, you know, that's the thing about, uh, um, you know, uh, being a clinician in the States. I mean, we have tremendous um, freedom to practice any way we want and to the detriment sometimes, because there's, we got some crazy doctors out there, but, uh, you know, I mean, if you're in private practice, you can essentially, you know, practice medicine the way you want. So it's just a matter of getting the degree getting through postgraduate medical training to be able to practice the way I knew would uh, uh, help my patients the most. Yeah. And, and I was thinking when you're just trying to trudge through, get, get through this whole training thing, it seems from what I remember reading in your book that you would go out and speak outside of kind of like the medical institutions. Was that kind of your, your way of keeping your sanity and doing what felt right? Oh, you know, I actually wrote a book about my time in medical school um, uh, called Heart Failure. Um, mm. And uh, so talk about all the, the, not only the nutrition issue, but all the various erosions of medical ethics that take place. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, and I think that was really my, um, saved me the most psychologically because every time something terrible would happen, and mostly it wasn't terrible happening to me, but something terrible happening to a patient that I was witnessing and me feeling helpless to be able to help somebody, some hapless victim of the system. Every time something horrible like that happened, you know, I, I could kind of be like an anthropologist. You know, I could distance myself and be like, oh, my God, that's going to make a great juicy chapter kind of thing. You know, and that gave me that kind of psychological. I was more observer rather than kind of uh, part of this insane system. Um, and so I'd go home and madly scribble um, all my thoughts down and help me kind of process what I went through, particularly if I felt I uh, couldn't be able to kind of have a more direct impact. Uh, Kevin? No. I've got, I've got but, another one, but go ahead. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll let you go then, because I, I see how excited you are. And uh... No, it's, it's great. I, there's just so many places we can go with this, but I, I remember specifically reading about you talking about, obviously, our medical system being for profit, and that, you know, even the way that we try to take care of patients, they're you know, kind of one-on-one, -on -one, and there's a limit to how many people you can impact in a day's work. And and how you recognize the value of expanding the reach of who hears the science-based type of information. So what was it like for you? When Did you realize that when you came across this, um, these other people that were as um, enthusiastic about nutrition and getting that information out there, such as the foundation that helped kind of launch or the seed money to launch this nutritionfacts.org, did, did you kind of know then that you needed to go online and project it in that way? Because from what I understand, you recognize the value of just going straight to the consumer. Yeah, we really needed to, I mean, I need to get this kind of life-changing, life-saving information into as many hands as possible. And it's like, how many patients can you see in a day, right? Um, and so then, uh, you know, I started speaking um, I actually started doing videos uh, back when we, I was sending out VHS tapes to people. <laughs> um, uh, and then uh, I felt all excited switching to DVD, but we still hadn't gone online just because, you know, I just didn't have the, the ability, the technical know-how. Yes. So you can, you know, go from reaching dozens of people a day to speaking hundreds to sending out DVDs, thousands. But if you want to reach millions of people, really had to get online. And so I was lucky that uh, there was a, a, a tech philanthropist um, who, uh, who made his money in the tech space and was like, the, 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 he was the one that did like at and website. I was like, all right, if we can do it, then, you know, and so they're like, I'll just get some of my people to make you a website. I was like, oh my God, okay. And so, wow. um, uh, so it was like a lot of in-kind donations to just build up everything. Um, and then just kind of pushed me off on my own. Um, and uh, that was uh, a little terrifying, but you know, I put a little, you know, orange donate button at the top and was just like, look, everything's free. But, you know, if you uh, kind of the Wikipedia model, right, everything's free. But if you appreciate the service, if everyone kicks in, you know, a few bucks, then, you know, one in a thousand people kicks in a few bucks. We're all set. It's just a 
kind of uh, magnitude of scale. And we just reach so many millions of people that, you know, we're able to employ now over a dozen folks. And uh, yeah, no, it's really, it's uh, a dream come true to just spend my days, you know, diving into the research and bringing it out to everybody. Yeah, well, I mean, it looks like I, I, I'm on your email list, so I know you're hiring more people. So this is obviously people find value in what you're doing. And, and first of all, thank you for, for what you're doing. But my one last question attached to this is, what was it like dealing with people's reactions to the kind of things you were doing when many of our colleagues don't even get how to even set up an, a website or what a domain name is? <laughs> Right. No, no, it was, uh, I mean, and I felt I was getting really late into the game. So this is like uh, 2011 uh, when uh, Nutrition Facts went up and I thought I was just like so far behind, but yeah, no, it, it's true that, um, you know, it's just the, the information space has uh, gotten very crowded. You know, I had this idealistic vision, <laughs> you know, that there, there was this kind of democracy, the internet brought this democratization of information you know, back, you know, 50 years ago, the tobacco industry knew all they had to do was pay off the AMA, control the doctors, control the message. And the AMA came out, said smoking is actually good for you. It's actually on balance beneficial. And like, if you were a consumer back then, what were you supposed to know? What are you going to pick up an encyclopedia Britannica or something? Right. But now no longer can there be a corporate stranglehold on the official kind of you know, professional filters of information. Now anybody can get basically information on anything. And I thought, well, look, obviously the truth will kind of bubble to the surface. Mm -hmm. um, and then everyone, you know, will be enlightened and we have this beautiful tech utopia. <laughs> and then the last couple of years happened <laughs> where somehow the truth doesn't float to the top. <laughs> um, and you yeah. know, it's just, it's been a big, you know, like you just, I just had this kind of really uh, this, this uh, naive, you know, vision of, well, obviously the truth will just get out there the most because yes. it's the truth, like kind of by definition. And almost, I think the truth is almost impaired. It's slowed down. It's the crazy, you know, infuriating stuff that spreads the quickest and, it's, we're almost handicapped just putting out real facts, boring statistics about real things in the world. I don't know. It's a, it's a tough time for, yeah. for those of us who just want to save lives like this COVID thing. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, like this is the time for the internet to shine. We can rapidly get evidence-based life-saving information to everyone's hands and it's been, you know, a total, total shit show. Yeah, it has. <laughs> so I'd like to, to delve into that a little bit more because I, I think a lot of physicians would say something similar. It's like, well, if the evidence is, is correct, that should change how we deliver care. And we, and we know that's simply not true because we could look at what the modern healthcare system does. Like just what you were started with, where we don't attend, we're not attending diet. We're not talking about nutrition. Um, but what have then you've discovered since starting Nutrition Facts in 2011? How have you evolved or how has the website evolved to make sure that good information is available for consumers out there? Good, relevant, evidence-based in, in, information that can be found in a, in a world that's getting increasingly Yeah, muddy. you know, I mean, I, I, unfortunately, I think we're still stuck back in that naive space of just like, well, let's put out the best information there is. And it'll just like somehow magically reach the most people. Um, something that kind of sets us apart, which was very important from day one, is that we want to not just cite the data. We actually want to show the data. So if you look at our videos, I mean, it's not just me spouting opinions. It's like, well, this is what the best available balance of evidence shows in the peer-reviewed medical literature. Here's the paper. Here's the quote. Here's the graph. Here's the link to download the paper yourself. And so you can see, make sure I didn't take anything out of context. So we have hyperlinks to all the sources and we actually show, you know, can we show our work? Um, and, uh, and I think that's critically, I mean, when it comes to something as life and death important as the health and well-being of yourself, your family, your patients, if there was ever anything 
any decision to be made based on the evidence, I mean, it should be that, right? Now, look, if you're shopping for some toaster online, some you know, random opinion from a stranger could actually be really useful. You know, they, they you know, review that, you know, that's great. But when it comes to your health, your family, you're going to just like take somebody's word from the gym about some new diet or some checkout aisle magazine. I mean, this is the most important decision for your health and longevity. And where, I mean, there's just no kind of accountability. Anytime anyone says anything about health, about really critically important things, the follow-up has to be, where did you get this information from, right? You weren't born with this information. I want to know your source. In fact, I don't just want to know, show me your source, right? I mean, um, because there's just, we live in a world now where even basic facts are contested. So it's critically important to know where this information comes from because it it has real life implications about, uh, you know, some of the most important things, life and death decisions. Yeah. So being that, um, I'm assuming, I didn't ever ask you the, the, was it family medicine, internal medicine? What was your original? Uh, GP. I would GP. Do a little bit of everything. Okay. So, so, you know, you're, you're not the traditional, um, you know, clinician in the clinic, just seeing one person at a time. Um, but now that you've built this, this nutritionfacts.org and you have such a following, how, how would you describe what your day-to-day life is that you've created by choice um, based off a lot of passion um, and evidence that you like to um, curate for, for the world to see or to hear? Um, how would you describe what your day-to-day life is now and um, you know, what you love about it? So uh, my focus is on uh, writing, research, and speaking. Uh, unfortunately, the speaking aspect, I was right <laughs> in the middle of a 200-city book tour yeah. where the world uh, clamped down and uh, i remember calling canceling everyone's like why are you canceling i'm like in a week you're not going to be asking that question i'm telling you <laughs> um uh so uh, yeah no that was that was bad so but so now it's just uh, writing and research um and so i spend basically half the day reading papers the other half writing you know summaries and i have a whole team of uh, articles, retrieval, uh, volunteers. Um, uh, uh, you know, I annotate all the PDFs and then I have uh, um, staff or volunteers um, compile all the annotations. Then I take those compilations and I, um, you know, write the narrative and then send it off to the video people and they, you know, pull all the sources and stuff. So, um, uh, so it's kind of half and half um, reading and writing um, and I'm just buffering out videos on nutrition facts to take a year off to write my next book, How Not to Age, which will be out uh, December 2022 on the latest in longevity research. Wonderful, that's great. So you work you work from home. That's kind of oh, your yeah. You see, I work from home on this treadmill. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, you know, 1.8 miles an hour, and I just walk all day. Yeah. And you have a remote team, I assume. So you just yep, communicate. all over. In fact, we have uh, one, two, three, four, one, five continents. We have uh, staff on five continents. How exciting. So it's, awesome. so it's really exciting. So um, I finish my work. I hand off work to someone who's 12 time zones away and is done by the time I wake up. So we can pass off. So we know we never have to wait on another person's work product because mm. their day is our night. It's really works out great. Wow, that's that's a good little nugget there, Kevin. Uh, well, I'm, I'm just sitting there because I'm looking at nutrition facts, and the amount of content you guys have is astounding. <laughs> like, yeah. if, if, for anybody who's watching this, make sure you go to nutrition facts. You've got it indexed. You got a you know individual topics. Um, unbelievable what this resource is and uh so now that you talked about your workflow i'm like okay that makes sense now if you have people multiple times because you're publishing like every day almost yeah 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 there's about uh there's videos on about two thousand health and nutrition topics uh but look we've gone almost a decade now yeah new content every day um yeah it's it's new compelling content i mean all the time that's how you know we, uh, you know, uh, we, you know, get people to look at our new work, but it's really sad because after the first day, mm-hmm. um, you know, old videos, which have great, important information, just no one sees it. It just kind of gets lost in the memory hole. Um, and, you know, everyone's looking at the latest video, which, you know, gets a whole bunch of views. 
Um, but then once it gets kind of cued back, I mean, it exists there. People are searching for it, but unfortunately it just kind of, you know, but that's why you just got to keep putting out new stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, it's, I, I mean, it's definitely prolific. I mean, there's just so much and I, I like it where you, you can specifically look up certain, um, you know, foods and you can capture some of those older ones. So there's a search yep. engine. So that makes it quite, uh, quite yeah, convenient. Or you can search by disease, you know, search room arthritis or search for anything and see what foods might help. Yeah. Um, you know, I wanted to mention, actually, I'll just, I'll do a little, eh, that was my first oh, book, <laughs> How Not to Die. And I know you have the cookbook for them and um, How Not to Diet in the cookbook. And uh, also- coming out, the new cookbook's coming out this December. So uh, okay, pre-order now. Yeah, I'm really excited about it. Okay. And is that Amazon as well? Yeah. How Not to Diet cookbook. Okay. Perfect. And you also did a How to Survive a Pandemic. How, how convenient. I, yeah, that was, uh, that was like three months came out with that book. Yeah, that, that's pretty impressive. But that, that's an important topic, because I think one of the things that's been really interesting about the COVID pandemic is when you start looking at the risk factors and we look at the people who are getting sick and dying, it's not that, un- it's all the stuff that we were neglecting beforehand. So, <laughs> oh my God, I couldn't say exactly. Obesity, diabetes, high blood pressure, right? I mean, uh, heart disease. This is what's killing everybody before. And so, yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, and, and if there was a time, it's like, okay, you have a pandemic and if and we don't have a, a cure and we don't have a vaccine or anything else. So if you get sick, this is bad news. Maybe we should be paying a little bit more attention to the stuff we're putting in our bodies, the movement we're doing and things like that. So, and this should be, and you know, for so many people who get who are locked down now, no longer are our kids getting cupcake celebrations every day. We don't, we're not walking by the donut shop every day. We're not going out to eat as much. This is the time to start the exercise program that you always knew you should start. This is the time to clean out your pantry. This is the time to start the meditation practice. I mean, this is, we should use this time to, and this will not only protect us against infectious disease threat now, but, you know, you know, by maintaining a healthy lifestyle, prevent all the chronic disease stuff down the road. Yep. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah there. <laughs> I mean, that, so that could be like the silver lining, right? Imagine someone cleans up their diet and lifestyle and then doesn't have a stroke next year because they were just trying to protect themselves from COVID. I mean, that's, a, that's fantastic. That's perfect. Well, I want to make sure that you let people know whatever you'd love to share, whether it's uh, some final words or the things coming up, obviously you got some books coming up. Um, you want to go ahead and share whatever you'd like. I just want to share the good news that we have tremendous power over our health, destiny, and longevity. The vast majority of premature death and disability is preventable with a plant-based diet and other healthy lifestyle behaviors. I encourage people to reach out. Um, uh, if there's any way I can ever help, my contact information is on the website. Um, and uh, keep up the great work. Well, thank you. Kevin, you want to take us out? Yeah, no, thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate it. This was a fantastic interview. Love your website. Like I am huge about people leveraging the internet, particularly the physician community, because like you were saying, there's so much bad information out there. And instead of complaining about it, it's up to us to really create it. And, and man, what a resource your website is. Thank you so much for your mission. Thank you for telling the viewers um, they have such a pot- positive attitude. And, and it was an absolute pleasure to talk with you today. So and happy to help. <laughs> and everybody else out there stay well this is the change physician podcast i'm your host dr kevin kukara with my co-host dr melissa katie and our wonderful uh, our wonderful guest dr michael gregor and until next time stay well awesome